have a great lead. Okay. Cool. I just I just love talking real estate. So I went to an appointment and opened my mouth and the guy's like, you know what? My brother that lives down by the temple is wanting to sell his house. I will take your card and give him a call. And I said, okay, I'll go down there and awesome. So yeah, I'm Congrats. tonight that leads into some that's why I'm here for this. Oh, good. You're ready for today's. Event. I am. Yeah, I've sat all the way up here. I am like, this is a, I am to the point where, just like you said in the beginning, you're almost afraid somebody's going to say yes uh -huh. and sell my house. Yep. <laughs> well, good. Well, hopefully, we'll help you today with that. So you're not so good. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, yesterday, so my dad and I have been working a lot on wholesaling deals, and we got in yesterday. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Congrats. That's a good deal. Where's it at? It's in Eagle Mountain. Eagle Mountain. Okay, cool. Awesome. That's exciting. Well, good. All right. Well, who wants to go first? I'll go Lisa. first. Okay. okay. It's fluffy today. You're just fluffy? <laughs> yeah. So I'm Lisa. I'm with Vanguard Title on the fourth floor. We're always here to help answer questions or um, lead you in right direction. Sometimes it's right back to us. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's great too, but um, we had a little saying on our closing board the other day, and I thought it was so awesome we printed it off. So it just says, be mindful of your thoughts and words, for they are the pin writing that which will be manifested. So, And of course, we always have the awesome pins. Thank, so. you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Paul, you get one too. All right. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, you know, you have big pins. Like, That's true. I'll leave the other ones over here. They burn out quick, but they have good pins. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was just for closing, though. <laughs> well, great. My name is Paul Jolly. I'm with Inspiro Financial. We're on the main floor. You probably walk by every time you get in the building. Uh, but we're an affiliated lender uh, relationship with Century 21 Everest. And uh, if you have not, if you're not familiar with us or would like to know more, uh, you're certainly welcome to come in and introduce you to some of the players down there, including our president and CEO, Christopher Jensen, great guy. Um, but uh, anyway, we're here to help, uh, help you and serve uh, you and your uh, clientele. And uh, I don't know if, uh, if you're missing one of these. Uh, this is a journal. Uh, Century 21 Everest is a big journaling company. And uh, to kind of store your thoughts and get all those things that you can refer back to. If you would like a journal, I have one here, but I have others, hundreds of others downstairs. So if you are uh, needing one, I'm happy to release this one today for those that might. Uh, and you even get a Inspiro ah, pen. Thank so, you. There you go. Weren't you just writing notes in? Uh, yeah, for her actually. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, good. Okay. So, anyway, are there any questions uh, that you have financially or mortgage-wise that uh, we can answer or help with? Well, very good. All the best in your, all the best in your efforts uh, with Century 21. They're, uh, hands down, the absolute best company here in the state of Utah. Uh, and certainly, I have some experience in that regard. You won't get support anywhere else that you get here. And, uh, so reach out. We've got a lot of experts. Certainly, Russ is one of them. And uh, again, we're just here to help you uh, get the uh, the level of success that you're looking for. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Pass these out here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're just going to do. Uh, the same kind of a thing of what we were working on on Tuesday with it, where um, I'm just going to go through and explain how I would explain this to a seller going through the paperwork, and then answer any questions that you guys have, talk about how to fill in the things that are on the lines and things, and just see what questions you guys have. So, sound good? All right, so similar to what we talked about on Tuesday, you'll notice it says this is a legally binding contract, and just like we were saying on Tuesday, for whatever reason, the buyer side of this we it's, is less enforced just in the industry, not not with us, but in the industry. And But on the seller side, for whatever reason, somebody signs this, it's like, nope, we're holding them to it. And, and like I said, I don't know why that is. I don't know why it ends up being that way, but for whatever reason, 
It is. So, uh, entered into that it effective the blank day of blank month of year. So clearly you're just going to put in the effective date there, right? And then uh, between Century Twenty One and the seller. So where do where do we find who's on title? So how do we put down? What should we put on that blank line for the seller? Okay, good. From the tax records. Any other ideas? Title company. Okay, we good. We can go to the title company. That's a good idea, actually. For the lender. Okay, perfect. For the owner. So yeah, so here's the thing. A lot of times, what will happen, and, and why I want to have a discussion on parts of this is, um, a lot of times, what will happen is we go to the county records, or and on the MLS, a lot of times you can get who the owners are on there, but. And it's right most of the time, but I would say don't rely on solely it being the uh, who the owners are. And, and so what I, let me give you a quick story of that. So I had um, an agent that was in the training program that had gone and gotten a listing. The market was similar to like it is today, where if you get a good price listing, it's going to sell quickly. So he gets this listing, comes, turns it into the office, gets put on the MLS, goes on to the MLS, as soon as it goes on the MLS, a buyer shows up, um, gives them an offer. In the midst of negotiating the offer, they get their preliminary title report, which, so let's pause for one second in my story. Once you get this filled out and signed by the seller, go to the title company and have them get you a preliminary title report ordered right away. So like as soon as you get the listing signed, tell them, hey, I got an order for you, we got a new listing, and have them go pull it. Now, the reason for that is what happened is so during he gets the offer, but he's already ordered this preliminary title report. They're in the midst of negotiating the offer, and he gets the preliminary title report. Well, looks at it, and on the preliminary title report, it shows that there's someone else on title. So this was he had gone out thinking this was just a single guy that he was listing the home. And what he found out, though, was that there was another person on title. So what does that mean? Both yeah, we need the signature from her as well. And so luckily they were still in the midst of negotiating this offer. So I told the agent, okay, your client's ready to accept, but you need to counter back on the offer and put in there that it's subject to whoever this lady is signing the agreement as well. So he calls the seller and asks the seller, hey, so who is this other person? You know, asked by name. And the uh, the seller says, oh, that's my mom. And great. Well, we need to get the mom's signature then. So the uh, seller, though, says, well, she's out of town and she's unavailable right now. She's like on a cruise or something. I can't remember what it was. But, but we, I don't have any way to get a hold of her. So she'll be back in a week. So we counter the offer, say it's subject to the mom accepting the uh, contract when she gets back from vacation. Well, so a week goes by. The buyer's now in the midst of doing their due diligence. A week goes by, and the agent comes to me and says, I, I still can't get a hold of the mom, so what do I do? Well, find out what's going on, and you know, we just got to keep working. So he goes and asks the seller. The seller says, uh, oh, she, she decided to stay on her vacation longer. And like I said, I don't remember where she was at or what was going on, but for whatever reason, she wasn't available. So uh, another week goes by, and finally we track down the mom. Get a hold of the mom, and he says, "Hey, we, you know, we've got this home under contract. We just need to get your signature on the contracts." And she goes, "Hold on, wait a minute. What are you guys doing? Like that is not okay. The whole reason, and what we found out is the whole reason she was on title was she had bought the home for her son, and once before he tried to sell the house, and she then jumped in and was like, "No, I don't want you selling it. Like I'm the one who bought the house, even though I put it in your name." And so. She then went and had herself put on title just so that this wouldn't happen. So the point of this, or the moral of the story is, again, trust. You know, If you're meeting with a seller and they say this is who's on title or you see it on the county records, trust them, but we want to verify. So we want to go to the title company and have them pro pull the preliminary title report so that we can see for sure who is on title to this property. Okay? Now, uh, how, do you, how do you necessarily know what title company the house is, who it's with? Oh, great question. Yeah, so it, it doesn't matter. Any any oh, of the title companies can do it. Yeah, so yeah, thank you for asking that. But yeah, 
any of the title companies that you can go to whoever your kind of your favorite is or whatever and and just have them do it and they'll take care of it. Yeah, great question. So what about though, let's say that um, when we check the county records or the get from the title company that it's in a trust. That is the situation with my first three listings that I have. Oh, really? And awesome. so the it, when it's what it says under here under the seller is it says the Shirley Wilson Trust. Yeah. Okay. Good. So that's what we would put on here is then the Shirley Wilson Trust. But then what does that what do we need then? A copy of it. Trustee. Yeah, we need to find out who is the trustee of that trust. So the because that that's who needs to be signing on behalf of, of the property. So make sense? Okay. So as you're getting this, just keep in mind on the name of the seller. Number one, we want to make sure we get anybody that is on there, their signature. Number two, if it is in a trust, that we get a copy of the trust. And how I always do it with the seller is I always just tell the seller that the, the title company is going to need the copy of the trust showing who can sign on behalf of the trust. And I just want to collect it as soon as I can. And again, it's tied to the story I just told you. What I don't want to do is go put a property on the MLS, start marketing it, we get a copy of the trust, and then find out somebody else has to sign. And I learned something interesting, too. I had a situation where one person's the trustee on the trust, and then there's a will with another person on the will. And so, but the trust trumps the will. Correct. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any other questions on that, on who's going in to, on the name of the seller there? I kind of already have a question. Sure. Um, like to get a preliminary title report, is that possible? Great question. So the the answer to that technically is yes, but in reality it's no. And so what I mean by that is, and, and I don't know if it's still this way, but I'm pretty sure it is, is the title insurance industry, the people that oversee title insurance, require them to charge you for, or, or the seller, either the agent or the seller, for ordering a preliminary title report. Mm -hmm. And and I think, if I remember right, it's like $125. So, but there's no requirement on them to collect that. So at one point, and this goes back a lot of years ago, but I was talking to the owner of one of the title companies, the one that I used, and he said what they would do every month is they would print out a stack, and, and like, probably like this, I think he said, like that big of invoices. Like for every agent that had ordered a preliminary title report during the month, they would just, and as soon as they had printed out the invoices saying you owed them money, they would take that and walk right over to the shredder and shred it. <laughs> and so, so, so that's where I say the answer is yes and no. Like technically, they're supposed to bill you, but you'll probably never ever see that bill, and so you'll never end up paying for it. So. The seller technically then does end up paying for that as part of their title insurance when they close. But but they usually are supposed to bill you, but again, there's no requirement that they collect on the bill, and so typically you'll never see one. So excellent question. All right. Uh, terms of the listing. So the seller grants the the company, including the seller's agent, which is you, as the authorized agent, and that it's going to end at 5 p.m. And, and keep that in mind that it ends at 5 p.m. A lot of times we we assume it goes till like midnight, but our, on our contract we're saying until 5 p.m. on the blank day of month and year. So how far out should we put the put that? Six months. Yeah, that's typically the norm that we do it. But don't be afraid of like there may be a scenario. Let's say that somebody came and said, "Hey, I got this five million dollar house that I want you to sell." You might want to go more like a year because it may take a little bit longer. Now, the flip side of that, though, for me, is here's what I have found. Now, and what I'm not doing is encouraging, I'm not encouraging you to not do six months. I would say, as a general rule, do six months. But here's what I've found, is typically, a seller gets frustrated about three or four months into it if it's not done. So for me, I say that, so I'm kind of going to talk on both sides for a second. On one side of me is I kind of don't like doing a six month because I always feel like if I can't get it done within four months, there's a problem. And usually the, by that time, the seller's frustrated, I'm frustrated, I, I want out of the listing, if, and they may too, I don't know. But 
for me, I've just kind of found, I personally like the idea of like a four month listing, but I, meaning, and now I say that, I will usually still do it as six months, but just kind of know, for me, in the back of my mind, if, if it is not sold within four months, I thought you were coming to class. I was like, whoa, Justin's coming? <laughs> yeah, someday I'll let you. <laughs> so, um, so typically, even though I'll do a six months, generally for me, if, the, if that property is not sold within, uh, what, did you guys like have a guys meeting somewhere? That, uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, there was no men like, here, and all of a sudden they <laughs> were trying to show up. So. <laughs> Good thing you're always here to remind me. Well, or I don't forget. Think, thank you. <laughs> so, um, so, so I still usually will do a six month, but just keep in mind, like for me, if it starts to get around into about four months and, and it's not sold, I usually start to feel like we're kind of wasting our time. Now, okay. is it really is it common to do like really short period of time, like a week? Because I was looking at listings um, last night and I was noticing a lot of them that were like listed and then they they went active and then they expired within a week and I was like yeah so no that is not normal so in, in fact so let's talk about that for a second because on uh, on the buyer one we Tuesday when we were talking about the buyer uh, buyer broker agreement on that one I'm not opposed to doing it for a week if somebody was really hesitant to signing the buyer broker I would just say let's sign it for a week then and then after a week we can reevaluate on a listing we don't want to do that so for me, I guess I would say, I think of the listing side being more, and there's no hard, fast rule on this. It's just, but for me, I think of it as it needs to be a minimum of four months because I just always feel like we're investing so much money into a marketing of a property that we need to be able to get a return on that. Mm -hmm. And so to list it for, hey, let, let me do it for a week. Yeah, like, we, we, is it because they weren't exclusive it. maybe and someone else sold it so they had yeah, to it was really weird it, it, it could be it wasn't sold but it um more, I, I looked to see if maybe it was owner agent or something to see if they were like you know yeah, no more times MLS than not or, what's happened is they listed it and then either changed their mind they didn't want to sell and so they just take it off and it expires I'm just surprised or, what I found yeah, or I've seen it where they get frustrated with their agent really quickly oh. because the agent sounded great until they got it pictured. Like, I remember um, an agent in the office that I started in that he was always getting complaints. And there's, this still exists today all over the place. But he would get so many complaints because he would go list a home and then he'd throw it on the MLS. And for him, it was like he would never call the seller again if the agent... Active. Yeah, it was just, hey, if we get an offer, I'll call the seller and go talk to him. If not, then he just didn't worry about it. So it's not uncommon for that kind of thing to happen where the seller gets frustrated for some, some something goes wrong, the agent said something the next day, did something, that they're like, hey, I want out of it, and cancel it. So, I mean, I wouldn't say there should be a lot of those, but that's what I would guess happened okay. on them. Uh -huh. So, well, so that would be a good one to call and try and get a listing with some. Huh? Uh, could be, yeah, could be. So, so for me, on the length of the time of the listing here, in the terms of the listing, I would say on that, um, kind of look at it as you typically want to do a six month. Four months would be okay. Pretty, if you're going to go less than a four month period, like for me, if somebody said, "Hey, we'll give you one," look, another guy. Walking they all have a party somewhere. So, um, for me, it would have to be more of a scenario of like the properties under like if they were saying I'll give you one month to do it I probably would be okay with that if I knew it's priced where I'm probably getting multiple offers tomorrow morning then in that scenario so um, anyway very very rare you're going to do less than probably a four month that's kind of what I would say on that. make sense any questions on that part Okay, so then the next thing on there, the ne that next blank line is where you're going to put in the address of the property, which hopefully is self-explanatory on that. All right, all right. Next then is brokerage fee. Now, so on this one, you'll notice uh, on the buyer one on Tuesday when we talked about the buyer broker, it showed the the brokerage fee of being three percent plus the two ninety five. This one, I again, we have multiple versions of this contract. 
meaning you we have them available that are six percent and seven percent, and we have them six percent with the two ninety five, six percent with three ninety five, six percent with four ninety five, six percent with five ninety five. The one that I've given you here is the seven percent plus a five ninety five acquisition or excuse me administration fee. So on this, typically what I would recommend is almost always I would say go in with this seven percent listing agreement now. If you remember on Tuesday, I think it was Tuesday, I told you guys about going door knocking yeah. and the, the, the last, last door knocked I knocked on, on said, yeah. yeah, we need to sell our house. So let me tell you the rest of that story now. So I go back to the office, I go to my manager and I say to my manager, hey, well, we're not door knocking today and I got somebody that wants to sell their house. So what do I do? And he grabbed the forms like basically this and handed it to me and said, just go read through these and let me know if you have any questions. So I went and didn't read through them. I just kind of glanced through them. And so I get out there to the sellers. I knock on the door. I go in. We sit down and we start to go through the contract. And we get to the brokerage <laughs> fee. And I'm telling him, so the fee for this to, to sell your home, and I look down and I notice that it says 7%. And I was like, in my mind, like in that fraction of a second, I'm like, is this really seven? I thought it was six. Like I didn't realize. Like, in in my head, in that fraction of a second, this is what's going on. So I say to him, "So the fee that we're going to charge you for selling your home is seven percent." And I just kept going, and he didn't say anything. And at the end, he signed it, and I took it back to the office and handed it to my manager and said, "Hey, okay, here you go. I got the contract signed." And um, I think all oh, these. <coughs> so. Uh, I said, I got the contract signed, here you go. And he takes it and he goes, good job. And I'm like, oh, thanks. But he, looked like, he was like overly excited for me, like when he was like, good job. I was like, okay, like, that's cool. So um, the next sales meeting that we had, and I don't remember what day that I had gotten it signed. It was like over a weekend or something. So the Tuesday, next Tuesday, we're at our sales meeting. And he starts the sales meeting and he says, hey, guys, I want to tell you, because I had been, I don't know, a couple months in the business. And he says, Russ got his first listing. And everyone's like, yay. And he goes, hold on, don't, don't get too excited just yet. And he goes, he took it at 7%. And like the whole room just like, whoa, that's awesome, good job. And I was like, what? Like, why is that so exciting? And, and afterwards, everyone was coming up to me going, how'd you get 7% on your first listing? And I said, I didn't know we could do less than that. I just thought that's what it was. So my recommendation for you is don't just assume that, oh, everybody's going to want a discount on the commission because that is not always the truth. So going in and so for me, I just like going in with this 7% because then even if it is a friend or something, I may have before I even go in cross out 7 and written 6 and initialed it. So that they, I, I can show them, look, I'm giving you a little bit of a discount. I thought you can't cross off. What? I thought you can't cross off. Yeah, technically you shouldn't. Yeah, technically you should do an addendum to this. Okay. Did you initial that's satisfactory? Yeah, you won't. We won't uh, dis. We won't throw it away. If if you had crossed it out in row six and initial it before they do. Now, if you did it afterwards, that'd be a problem. But what's the rep <clears throat> Yeah, the REPC for sure, I would say don't because really you're not a party to that contract. At least this one, okay. the company okay. is. So, But it, it's the, the recommendation though still, Karina, is to check the box for there's attachments to it and then do it on an addendum would be the ideal scenario. But if I'm telling the truth, when I'm doing it for like a friend like that, I just cross it out initially. <laughs> so, all right. Any questions on the brokerage fee section here? I'm still waiting. I told you guys on Tuesday there's a question that usually comes up. I've been thinking about it. Yeah. You guys still haven't asked on it. Have to do something to do with the fee? <clears throat> yeah. They ask if you get a discount, right? Now, I have a question. Now, if you're going into it knowing that they're possibly going to want to drop that 6%, would you automatically take an addendum with you for them to sign? Uh, probably. Or just like I said, I would cross it out. Okay. And then the administration fee is flexible. We're able to say, you know, I can actually lower that too because that to, makes you look really good. Like, I can actually lower that too for you. To 295. 295 is the Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and on that, 
the your just your agreement on your independent contractor agreement with the company is that you will charge a minimum of two ninety five, and if you don't, that you it'll that the company can take it out of your portion of the commission. So the two ninety five goes directly to the company. It goes directly to the company. Okay. Yeah, I didn't realize so yet Tuesday either on the BAC. I just always assumed it was a split. So you can put anything you want on the BAC of that percentage. Yeah, correct. So if you get seven percent, you can still put it. You can still put three. Yeah, for me personally, like I always have just done it as a split. Now, with that being said, if I went and did a five percent, I would, I personally, I just have this, like, strong belief of like we should offer three percent to whoever brings in the buyer, and and I say that because here's the frustration that I'm seeing. I'm seeing agents, and I've seen it within our own company, go list a property at seven percent, and then they offer two and a half on the MLS, and and I just think. It, yes, based on the market, can you get away with that? Yeah, but here's the challenge. What people are not thinking is into the future. Um, it's going to be hard to rein that back in. When, when, when the market softens and it's a little harder to get a house sold, it's going to be harder. And, and the example I'll use with you is I go down and I train at our California offices all the time. The norm down there is 5%, and they do 2 and a half, 2 and a half. And I don't want us to get to that point. And so for me, that's where I just have this belief of, if you're going to go list a property at less than a 6%, you should still offer three. Meaning, just because you discount your, I'm going to say this and don't hear it bad, even though it means bad. <laughs> just because you're not worth, it doesn't mean I'm not, if I, if I bring the buyer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so like, to me, like, don't, I don't think the listing agent should be determining what I'm, how I'm going to get paid on a house. So, um, it's just kind of the story I told you guys on Tuesday of calling up the, the agent, uh, the listing agent, and saying, hey, my clients have signed a buyer broker that says I'm going to get paid 3%. They can't afford to do that. So, like, it might mean they don't buy your house. Because I wanted to see, like, like, so I, for you guys, even if you're going to be, and, and like I said, I would have taken it. If they wanted that house, I would have taken it. In fact, I told you these guys are out looking at houses right now. They found one yesterday that they want to write an offer on, and guess what? Two and a half percent. So here's what we did though. We wrote up a um, commission agreement saying 3% to be paid on the broke buyer agency commission and sent that first with before the offer and then sent the offer over after and just said if you're going to counter, do it on the price. Don't, don't mess with the, the BAC. Like, so don't be afraid. To like stand up for your worth, like you guys, you deserve to get paid. So, so what did you send first? The, it, it's a commission agreement. Oh, so, because okay. how it works is whatever is on the MLS, which if we go forward here into your pages, onto I probably should number these pages. Where's that? So if you go into the MLS data input sheet, so it's page three of six of that one, of the MLS data input sheet, page three of six, which is the bottom right of it. On that page, if you look up about three-fourths of the way down, it has compensation offered BAC. Mm -hmm. Three of six and three of seven. Yeah. Based on gross or net? Uh, page net? three of six. Unless yours has seven. So that's where that's that's where that would be showing on the MLS. But when you see that on there, like don't just automatically accept. Well, dang, I'm only gonna get two and a half. Like, be willing to stand up for you know. Hey, we deserve. We work hard. As you, if you haven't learned yet, you're gonna learn. Like a lot of people come into this business because. Why? why? Why do a ton of people come into real estate? Because they think it's easy money. Like a lot of times people will come into it because they go, I sold a house and I saw how much money that agent made and I looked at what they did and I was like, I, you know, I could do that. And, and then they come in and then what do you find out really quickly? It's a lot of work. That sometimes we do all the work for how much? 
Nothing. Yeah. So, like, to some extent, you have to keep that in mind. It's and probably the best example I could use of that would be credit cards. Why are credit card interest rates so high? Like, why? Do, you go throw your money in the savings account at the bank, and you're getting less than one percent interest on it. Yet, you go get a credit card, and you're paying fifteen, eighteen. Why? Why can they charge, or why do they charge? Because they can. They can, true, but but why do they do that? There's a reason they do it. Because it's unsecured funds and so many people default. That's exactly um, right. So think of your commission as kind of the same thing. The reason that we are doing it, what may to them look like, wow, you got a high ton of money off of this deal and you didn't really do a whole lot, is to offset the ones that we do do a whole lot and then never get paid anything off of. So like, just don't discount your own worth, I guess, is what I'm saying on if and if it doesn't hurt to ask, I mean, if they say no, you know, and your buyer still wants the house, you know. Yeah, and that's just it. Where we are talking about our fiduciary duties, like I'm all for, like if that's the house they want, then that's great. But but no, you can say to your client though, that's awesome. But remember, you signed this buyer broker agreement that says I'm going to get three percent. This one's only offering two and a half. So as a result of that, we're going to have to do it. Now there are some ways you can go about doing it. So mm -hmm. and, and I'll talk about uh, one of those in just a second. I was going to say, and they probably got real estate agreement for six percent anyway, so it just means real estate agent is trying to be three mm -hmm. and a half. So. Could be. Like, I think that does happen. Although more times than not, it's the agent is going in and doing it at five and offering two and a half. Just trying to get the listing. Just trying to get. I mean, I've seen some where the agent listed it at four, and they're offering two and a half and going to keep one and a half, which, again, I'm like, I just don't. So you said you suggest what to do is to submit a commission. What's the commission formation? It's a um, commission agreement. Agreement. You send that along with the offer. Is okay. that what you're saying? Yep. Okay. And and so keep in mind that how this all works is just because by being members of the board of realtors, by us being realtors, we automatically have an agreement to share commissions. Yep. So whatever is showing on that on the MLS as the BAC is the agreement. So. We don't need any commission commission agreement if we're going to accept what's on there. Right. If you're going to change what's on the MLS, though, then we have to have that. Now, let me ex explain even further on that. Let's say that you go into a builder and the property that your client wants to buy is not on the MLS. Are you owed a commission? No. Yeah, yeah it, you're not. If if um, unless, but well, yeah, if it is not on the MLS. You need to use one of these commission agreements along with your offer. Don't forget that. Okay. So, and let me give you one other quick story on that. Is so I used to do a lot of foreclosed homes. So I had a, had some banks that would contact me when they had a home they needed to sell, and I would help them get the property sold. Well, this one particular time, uh, I got this property. It was down in Utah County, and it. Uh, I'm chasing you. <laughs> So, this property was a townhouse, and what had happened is this was during the downturn that had happened, so this is probably 2010 ish. And what had happened was they didn't have, in order to get for a property to get a loan on it, if it's part of an HOA, they want to see that the HOA is solvent, like that they have enough money in reserves to take care of things, stuff like that. Well, this particular HOA didn't have that. In fact, they were way behind, like a lot of their pe people living in their properties were not paying their HOA dues monthly, so they were way, way behind. So this property was going to be really hard to sell, so we had to price it really low. So we priced it way below the market value because we had to, essentially in that situation, that would be one like you were talking about earlier, Karina, that it, it's cash only. we got to find somebody to pay cash because nobody, no bank is going to loan on it because of the HOA. So we put it on there, we put it at a way reduced price. I get an offer that comes in and, and when it comes in though, the guy that wrote the offer called me and said, I'm an attorney and so I'm gonna be representing these people in purchasing the house, so I'm sending you over an offer. Great, he sends over the offer on the rep it says he's representing them, everything's fine that way, but now, can an attorney write an offer on a property even though they don't have a real estate license? Yes. Yes. Yeah, they can because they're an attorney, right? But does that mean they're owed a commission? No. 
So I had gone to my broker at the time and said, because the guy was kind of a jerk too, like when he called me, the way he was talking to me. So I went to my broker and I said, hey, so this guy didn't send over anything asking us to pay him a commission. Do I have to pay him a commission? And he said, and my broker said, no. Like he's not owed a commission because he didn't give us anything saying it. He's not a realtor. So, and again, just keep in mind, the reason we don't have to do commission instructions every single deal we do is because by being realtors, we've already made that agreement. So anytime you're dealing with somebody that's a non-realtor, make sure you're using commission instructions. So throughout the transaction, I just kept doing it, but I was just like, at closing, he's going to be mad, but I don't care because I'm not, because he's a jerk. I'm like, I'm going to pay him. I don't care. Right before their finance and appraisal deadline, they called and canceled and moved on to something else. So it didn't end up. I, I did. I was like excited because I was like, I'm going to keep the whole six percent now, but <laughs> didn't happen. But we ended up do, did getting that property sold. But so just keep in mind that because of being realtors, we've got that agreement to share commissions. <laughs> but if you're doing something that is modifying it, what it says on the MLS, or they are not part of the MLS, we need to use that commission. Escrow instruction agreement that, that they will everyone will sign. Make sense? Okay. All right. Any other questions on the brokerage fee? All right. I was just gonna say. Um, now, if the market was to change, would it be advantageous to pay more to the buyer's um, agents? More it percentage? is always more advantageous to pay more to the buyer's agent. Okay. But why do you say that? Well, I mean, like, if the market was to change, so where it was like there's lots of properties, oh. and very few buyers, and you want yeah, to Yeah, we will start to see that a little bit change, for sure. I've seen flat rate companies offering 4% lately. Really? Yeah, I've seen that on a couple properties. Hmm. That's good. I like it. I mean, it's just, it's like we talked about on Tuesday. If you saw you were going to get paid 4%, on this house versus three percent on this yeah. house. What are you going to do differently? I mean, and I mean, work harder. And I get it. We're like I'm not discounting our fiduciary duties because we do have those, and it shouldn't matter. But if you tell the truth, like, what are you thinking when you see? Like, for me, I know at least I'm like, oh, I hope they like this house. Mm -hmm. Like, at a minimum, you're saying that. Right. So right. anyway. But you're not steering them. No, I'm not. No, no. I'm going to still no. let them buy whatever house. Yeah. They All right. Any other questions, brokerage? We beat it up enough? Oh, I know what. I was going to tell you one other thing. So in terms of getting, when you're representing the buyer, in terms of getting the full amount, one of the things that you can always do is just you can ask the seller to pay it for your buyer. So we have an addendum that is available that you can ask the seller to pay the buyer. So I, on this one that I told you about last night, we sent over the commission agreement that to change it to 3%. In the event he comes back and says no on that, what I would do is then say, let's go back and do a counter offer and on the addendum, ask the seller to pay a half of a percent towards the buyer's obligation that they have to us. Does but that that's the closing costs? What's that? Yeah, that's the closing costs. So it's, it's, it's worded separately from the closing costs, but essentially it's the same. Part concept. of the concession. So you're just saying that it removes the agent from it and it's just doing yeah, so but you got to be careful on that though because now here's why. So make if you're going to do it, there's we have an addendum that is for this purpose. Make sure you use it because in our code of ethics, in uh, Article Number Sixteen, it says that you cannot, we as agents, so we, buyer or seller side doesn't matter, cannot negotiate our commissions as part of a real estate purchase contract. Now why? Huh? Why can't we? Because um, it's actually between the broker and the seller? Yeah, good. So think of it as if here's the seller, here's the buyer, this is the listing agent, this is the buyer's agent here. Okay. So what what is the contract that is between the seller and the listing agent? Between the brokerage. Say that again. Between the brokerage? Yeah, between the brokerage and the seller. What is the... Sub agent? Yeah, this oh, form we're looking at right now, right? Okay, That's yeah. the listing agreement. What is the form between, what's the contract between the buyer and the buyer's agent? Buyer broker. The buyer broker. What is the connection between the buyer and the seller? The reps. Yeah, the reps is going to be what binds them, right? So then what is between here and here, the agreement, which we've been just talking about? Yeah, the MLS. 
is what does that. So the problem is if, if you throw commissions into the rep C, you're now trying to modify an agreement that is between down here. These two parties are not part of the rep C. So when we if you, now here's the real reason though, let's get to the detail of it. Here's what really happens. Imagine this. Let's say that um, Jill, that you've got a list and I bring the buyer to you. And I don't like you for whatever reason. And so I want to try to just like make her life miserable. And so I write a contract for my buyer that says, you know, seller, here's the price, blah, blah, blah. And then I do an addendum that says, um, buyers will only pay the purchase price of full, whatever it is, full price, if the listing agent will reduce her commission by 1%. So I hand it to you. Now, what by law, any offer that's written, what do you have to do with it? You got to present it. So now you go present that to your seller, and your seller looks down and other thing goes, "Oh, full price offer. That's great." What are you going to say to your seller? Mm -hmm. Full price offer. Yes, full price. We're excited. Yeah, but but you agree to reduce me? by one percent. Yeah, but that's not the seller reducing it to you reducing. That's not the seller payment. That's a, you you agreeing to reduce your commission. Mm -hmm. Not the seller. But then that puts that within the spectrum of the rep seat. Right? Right. So that is not but, ethical. But right. That, that's what we're saying. This is why it's not ethical. Because what are you going to do when the seller says, oh, awesome, Jill. Love it. We love this offer. Yeah, let's accept it. You tell them they, they have to pay the extra 1%. But she can't tell the seller to not accept it. So uh, you guys tell me? What do you think? I mean, what, first, let's deal with what, how are you going to handle it? I'm a seller. I'm so excited. I got this offer. And it's, it's subject to you reducing your commission by 1%, but I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Like, I'm going to get my full offer. And actually, it's going to save me 1%. So it's well, really a good thing. Though. Like, I'm getting an extra 1% more on the sale of this than I thought I was going to get. That's so exciting. You tell me. What do you say? Well, well what would you do? Are you just going to say okay? No. So what are you going to say? That it's not ethical. Okay, so you say to me it's not ethical, and I'm the seller now. Well, it's not even binding. I would say she you signed a contract. Client. Client. Can you see, though, that like, it puts you as the listing agent in this awkward right. position of, like, the only thing in the way of this deal happening is my commission. Mm -hmm. Right. So, which is why it's not ethical to put it put it in there. So, but we have an addendum that, that allows, so I, that I, and this is a very, very thin line, like razor edge, you got to be careful, which is why I'm saying use the R addendum because it's worded properly. It's not okay for me as the buyer's agent to say reduce your commission or, or even to say it as um, full price offer, but uh, the buyer's agency commission has to be 4%. Right, give it her. Like, I can't mock because that puts again. That's putting Jill in this awkward position that it makes it. If she says no, her client's like, "Well, great, now I just lost a sale of my house because you wouldn't reduce your commission by one percent." Like, can you see the issue that that creates? So that's why it's an ethics violation to do that. But it's not an ethics violation for me to come for the. So let me word this right. It's not an ethics viol. It's an. It is an ethics violation for the buyer's agent to ask the seller to modify this agreement. But it's not one for the buyer's agent to ask the seller to pay it on behalf of their buyer. Does that make sense? So, and this is why I'm saying you gotta make sure you use the right addendum because the way that it's worded is it's saying that the seller will pay this fee that the buyer owes to us. I'm just confused because, I mean, isn't that already what's happening with the listing brokerage? Paying the buyer's agent commission. What do you mean? Because like the seller is already paying the buyer's agent commission. That's coming out of the six percent sale of their home. So I'm just confused. Like what's changing? Okay. So, so, and uh, this may or may not explain. If it doesn't, then I'll go a different route. When we go list this property, if, if I'm using this form, the seller is agreeing to pay me, the listing agent, seven percent. So the seller is paying all of that technically to me then I'm deciding to share whatever, 3% or 3.5, whatever I do, on the MLS with them. So if this, 
where the issue comes into play is if this person is trying to modify this agreement. So what you're saying is that they're asking in addition to the 7%, let's say. They would have to ask the seller, hey, are you willing to? Because you're not modifying the agreement, you're adding them to add on additional half percent or whatever. Is that correct? Yeah, what, what I'm doing is saying, yeah, they've agreed here, let's say it was 5% and they're offering two and a half and keeping two and a half. So what what I'm, if I'm doing it as part of it as an addendum in the REPSI, really I'm, I'm actually not having this person do it, I'm getting the buyer to do it for me. Does that make sense? I'm getting the buyer to say, hey, I owe this person an additional half of a percent, so I want you as part of this offer to pay it for them. So technically you're going to pay instead of 5%, you're going to pay 5.5%. Mm -hmm. so the although, although, hang on, me, although they're still only paying 5% here, they're just going to give the buyer a credit of a half of a percent that they can then give to me. Right, but that comes out of their funds. Correct. So it, it's technically 5%. See, and the, here's what I feel like. I just feel like, and again, I almost, I wouldn't quite call it a crusade for me, but somewhat of one of like, I want to protect that because before long, we'll be down to like, okay, we go list a house for 4% and we each get two on the, like in New York, that is what happens. You go, they take a listing, it's 4%, they offer two across the MLS. In California today, it's norm to get five and you offer two and a half and you get two and a half. Like, so to me, I look at it as like, do everything we can to protect our, what we're getting paid so that we can. Their home values are much higher though there. They're, yeah. they're selling these homes for yeah, a million, like, not 275,000 yeah, dollars. commissions. And they, they also are a lot more sue happy than we are here too. Yeah. Like you get sued more there than you do here. So like, that's how I would justify, well, I should get paid a little more because I'm at risk more as well. Somebody else have Tell me your name. I'm Jill also. Oh, okay. Um, so if I ask questions that seem ridiculous, I'm new. Okay, we're all in here. Mm -hmm. But most of them in here are new, so mm -hmm. they're all in the same. I have two questions. Okay, but it does say that our commission is not set in stone. It's always negotiable. Okay, Correct. it's not like there's a rule uh -huh. of what you have to pay anybody. Correct. So it's okay. So I just so I start at six and go up seven yeah. eight nine. Tell me when to stop. Ten <laughs> eleven. <laughs> so it's like it's not. So it is commissions are negotiable. Correct. There's nothing wrong with negotiating commissions. No. Is what you're saying. Correct. But how but but there is something wrong with me negotiating the commission buyers agent between these two. Between. So I, like I said, I know this can be like a little confusing because I can't get in the way of this agreement, but. But I have a separate agreement here, and I can ask the seller, the, excuse me, the buyer can ask the seller to pay that for me. So can I tell you real quick, I just sure. sold, I'm selling my house, okay, so I... What did you list, how much commission are you paying? I'm just kidding. Um, so, I'm, so I'm a listing agent, okay, okay right? So I just, um, I'm going to close in a week, and I had two offers, and the offer I took, the agent said, um... I'll just uh, I'll just charge two percent commission. So she asked me, you know, if you take my offer, I'll only charge two percent commission. So we agreed to that. I don't know if we did something wrong, <laughs> but um, but because I'm so it's my home, so I'm just paying you know like to the brokerage. It's not the same deal, right? You're just paying your, and your uh, flat fee if it's your own. So I agreed to that. So was there something wrong with what I, I mean? Did so I agree? I'd have to look at the addendum. So oh, did they put it on an addendum? And what did how was it? What did they say? Just. Um, sellers, don't ask me how to Okay, say so but basically uh, just seller, saying that you would only no, no, pay their... commission 2%. Did you put yeah. it on the MLS? So technically, they, you didn't do anything wrong, but they did. But because you did? Yeah, that's an ethics violation. So the, the, but why is it, it an ethics violation to negotiate a commission? To just how they sell. Because what they're doing is they're... The reason it's an ethics violation is because what that agent just did is... They were just negotiating on behalf of a contract they're not even part of. Because you now in this scenario, your listing agreement was with you, so so it's it's different. There, I mean, sort of. Well, because but, she didn't have it on the MLS, she wasn't required to pay it. Yeah, that's true too. No, but it was on the MLS. oh, I thought you said no. No, yes, it, it was on. The oh, okay, MLS. okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. So technically, they should have just sent over commission instructions. They should have called you. So here's what the process should have looked like. Hey, Jill, this is Russ. Hey, um, I'm going to be bringing an offer on the home, but uh, 
Did they offer a little bit less? Is that why? No. Or why would they do that? Because there was two offers. Oh, two okay. Offers. So, okay. So I'm saying, so Jill, hey, um, I'm bringing you an offer, and we really want the house. So, like, I'm willing to only take a two percent commission if, if you'll take our offer. That's what she did. Okay, and you say yes, great. Then they should have sent over commission instructions, a commission agreement that changed, modified it from three to two. Okay, you said that damn and wrote it on. Yeah. yeah. So it meaning like you're not going to get in trouble. They're probably not going to get in trouble. But if something went haywire and you wanted to get them in trouble, you could go to the board and file an ethics violation. So what you're saying today wrong is it should have been an addendum like worded correctly. So it should have been, yeah, in this scenario, the only, no, it shouldn't have been a part of it uh, at all. There should have been a separate commission agreement between here. Done. Because on, on this one where they were lowering it, the, the um, you wouldn't, like it, the addendum that I was telling you about would be to say, we want the seller to pay this on behalf of the buyer, but where they were lowering it, you wouldn't want to say, like, the buyer's not going to say, well, I mean, I guess the buyer could. No, good. So what, they what need to do a commission. So it just was a commission agreement she should have done instead of an addendum. Correct. Yeah, and, like, and don't, at this point, I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't go back and go, oh, we did it wrong. I mean, you might want to say we did it wrong, but... Like, I wouldn't worry about anything, especially you, because you didn't do anything wrong. Technically, the other agent did. Okay, so but, she should have just done the paperwork differently yeah. than what she did. So yeah, because again, the problem is, what you don't want, I, at least I don't want, is I don't want somebody coming back and saying, change your commission and we'll, we got a deal. Because then the client's looking at you going, all right, you're going to get in the way of me getting my house. <coughs> like, you're not willing to give up that. Like, you're still making ten grand. But like, that's not enough. So, you know what I mean? Russ, besides an ethic violation, is there any other, like anything else that forbids like the, the, a buyer's agent trying to modify the contract between a seller or seller's agent? It's just ethics. Well, in this case, that was a little different too because they were lowering their commission. Right. They were getting mm -hmm. more commission. And well, she's the although same that, Although the lowering of it, though, still could be, meaning like if, if what they had done is come back and said, hey, you, both agents reduce your commission 1% and we got a deal. That that's where it can be. Can I just comment on that, Russ? Yes. For the state of Utah and the Good and Fair Dealing Act, we're a, we're a code state. That yeah, what did you say? We're a what? We're a code state. Code? Code. Okay. Code state. That can get you in trouble if they take it deeper because they could take it to the level of actually negotiating in another agreement that has nothing to do with you. Right. So yeah, so I guess that's true. Yeah. So you're, you're trying to change a legally binding Yeah, you're trying to modify a contract you're not, the, that you're not part of. That's the ticket. Yeah. And the, the, the first level of understanding that is the ethics violation, but it could go past that. Now, at the risk of this turning into even longer, uh, <laughs> and I don't mean that bad, but um, so I'm glad you're here. Um, there's another option that you can do on this as well. It, Although, if you're going to do this, like, make sure you get us involved. But sometimes what will happen, how common is it today to ask the seller to pay the buyer's closing costs? Very, very common, right? So one of the other options that you can do is you could get them to agree to pay closing costs, and then once they've agreed to pay the closing costs, go, go and do an addendum then modifying how this looks. But to where what you do is have... The, let's say it was a 2% or something, you could have 1% of the, if they've agreed to pay 3% towards the buyer's closing costs, you could get 1% of that to go towards our commission, 2% goes towards the closing costs, and then you could have the lender cover through points 1%. Does that, do you guys follow me? So you have to work that through the lender. So what would happen is the lender would just charge them a little bit higher of an interest rate, and then the lender would pay part of the closing costs. So really, at the end of the day, it's no extra money out of the seller's pocket. But the buyer has to pay a higher interest? Okay, good. I was, I was thinking, okay, somebody going to ask the question. So what happens now? So, so now, what's, what's your thought on that? Um, you know, at that point, it's not the best interest of your buyer. That depends. Your However, if you're holding a house for a short period of time, or a long period of time, depends on what your interest rate is. And even if it's a long period, a lot of times a lender will be like, well, well, I'm not sure we want to do that or whatever. But 
But the advantage is what they can do is they can do it this way, and then what you're what you're saying wrong is right is they could actually, even if you're going to plan to keep the property forever, six months later they could go do a refinance, drop the interest rate back down. So yes, is it going to cost the buyer a little bit more in their payments? Yeah, but, you know, but 20, then they don't maybe. have to pay you that one percent that they agreed Correct. to in the buyer agreement. Correct. So it's just that's just another idea of a way around like. Can you see I'm trying to make sure you guys get paid your full worth? So that's if they're offering 2% buyer then you could go ahead and You could try. So the, my first would to say to do is to try to just call. For me, I like to just call and say, hey, Rick, yeah. I noticed your listing. My buyers went and looked at it. They love it. The problem is they have signed a buyer broker that they owe me 3%. Oh. You're only offering 2 Yeah. And so it. the challenge is they don't have that extra 1%, and uh -huh. we're going to charge them that if they buy this house. Ouch. So they might not buy your house and go find something else because they can't pay that. And even if I have – remember on Tuesday I told you I may not have even talked to my client about it yet. I'm playing – this is right. called negotiation. Yeah. So, hey, what – so anything we can, can, you know, if I send over a commission agreement, would you be willing to change it to 3% on this yeah, offer? Yeah, you give me a great offer, I'm willing. Okay, so boom. But, See, now I just... But let's roll it the other way now. No, yeah. we can't. I mean, there's just, this is all there is, Russ. I they may know that trip. <laughs> well, look, there's so many multiple ways. But in, in our current market, they probably would yeah. say, no, sorry, like, we'll sell it to somebody else. In which case, I'll say, okay, well... Good luck to you. Like I'm gonna, I'll let my clients know. I don't know what they're gonna want to do. And again, I'm playing poker because I haven't even talked to my clients. <coughs> and if they I'll don't buy on that, you. I'm certainly gonna go. Well, well, they pay closing costs. Well, yeah, yeah they'll pay closing costs. You don't want to go idiot, but that's not what we do because they're just. It's two different things, and they've already prepped their seller for closing, for closing costs. costs. That's why they don't want to pay that extra percent. But if you can get the closing costs, just what he showed you on the board. Leverage in that way. They didn't know I hit them. Yeah. So <laughs> just know, like, I'm trying to get you guys your full amount of money, which is awesome. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, brokers? Yeah. So say that scenario does happen. What do? What would I say? Okay. Which scenario? If if you say there's a buyer here, but they have said that they owe, oh. you know, in the offer, you have to reduce your commission. Well, so you can't. I wouldn't put it in the offer. It wouldn't be the part of the Repsy because that's where it's an ethics violation. Right. But if I, meaning if I just called you, is that what you're asking? No. no are you saying if you received an if offer? If I received like that? an offer like that, so what do I say? Oh, that had the commissions in it. Th that had them reduced, but they were. Yes. Reduced okay. Great. I see. Before you go to your client, so yeah, let's role play it. So let's say you just sent it to me. So I just got it. I'm looking through it and I see you're asking me on an addendum to reduce the commission. Ring, ring, ring. Hey, Jill. This is Russ. Hey, I just got your offer, thanks. I really appreciate it. And wow, that looks great from your seller. Well, just one concern. There's an ethics violation in this offer. Are you sure you want me to present it? <laughs> mm. uh, and then what are they going to say? What's uh, the ethics what violation? Do? Well, you can't negotiate commissions as part of a, of a contract. So do you want me to tear this one up and you can rewrite it? And yes. They're probably going to go, well, what do you... Uh, let me talk to my broker and I'll call you back. And, and then in that, if they said that, I would say, well, let me send you the code of ethics that says it. And it's in Article 16. There's a subsection that explains that, modifying it. And I would send it over and just say, talk to your, here it is, talk to your broker about it and try to get it fixed. Because, again, the problem is if I go sit down with my seller and present it and it's a great looking offer, they're like, hey, as long as you reduce your commission, we got a deal. That's awesome. Right, right. Now, hopefully the seller goes, no, that's not fair. That's not fair to you. We're not doing that. Or they might think, There's that's not fair because now I have to pay the other part. We already have an agreement. So I'm going to pay. I'm no way to, you know. So yeah. you just don't present yeah. it. So, well, I wouldn't say don't present it. I would call the agent first and say, and in the event you're going to have it submitted this way, I will be turning it into the board as an ethics violation, FYI. So, uh -huh. that, that was my question. I was going to say, are you still presenting it after you told them? If they said, nope, present it like it is, I'm not changing it, I'd say, great, I'm going to file an, a complaint at the board for an ethics violation. And I'm going to make sure to know, let them know that I gave you the opportunity to not do it, or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's you a bad have day to present. That's a bad day. Because, yeah, yeah you have to, yeah. if it's written, i got to present it. But I could give them the option to fix it first before presenting it. So. All right. Okay. Woo! Well, let me ask you a quick okay. question. <laughs> have you received offers like that before? 
you know, honestly, it's very, very rare that you're going to come across it. I think that I, I think I did get one once that was that way. But when I called and said, I called them and just said, look, my, if I remember right, it was a seller that I had a good relationship with, and I just told them my company's not going to do this. So we just countered it back and said, no, we'll do, we'll do everything else but that. So, and again, it's some of that is even tied to like I told you guys on Tuesday. I always approach it as the other agent needs the money worse than me. So when I when I did that little role play thing with Rick here of saying, hey, I got a great offer coming for you, but we got to get a little, like I just look at it from the standpoint of that I approach it as I'll bet you he wants this closing worse than I do and that he'll be willing, if he has to, to give up half of a percent on his side to give it to me, which... Again, I just if you're going to go out and do that and cut my commission on the buy side because you, you're not strong enough listing agent, that's not, I just feel like that's not fair. Um, I just have another question. Where do we write the like? What do we write down the other the buyer's percentage of the listing uh, commission? There's a buyer agreement. Yeah, for the buyer agreement. So you said on here it says seven percent. Where's the language? To oh, so on the buyer. On the buyer, when, so there's a buyer broker agreement. It's in the same section, section two. But it says 3%. Three percent, three percent. And then oh, the yeah. administration. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just on this page. Yeah, perfect. So, which we have had um, agents changing the buyer broker on to be 4% instead of 3 So they're telling their buyer it's a 4%. And then they've gone to the listing agent saying, doing exactly what we're talking about, but even though they're offering 3 trying to get 4 out of them. I, that's a little extreme, I would say, but just FYI. All right. Any other thing? Anything else on brokerage fee? Oh. All right. We're moving on. Last chance. All right. Protection period. If within blank months after the termination of this listing, how long? What should we put in there? This protection period. Three months. Three to six months. Three to six. Okay. Yeah. Minimum, I would say put one. And I think I told you guys on Tuesday. I saw one recently where. The agent put zero, and then it actually came back to where there was nothing we could do about it. And had they not, the people sold the house, we could have went and said, hey, these people looked at the house while we had it listed, we're over commission. All right, so I put at least one month in there, three's great. But here's how I explain it to the seller. Remember I told you part of this is to let you know how I would explain it to the seller? When I get to protection period, basically I tell the seller, this just keeps honest people honest. The purpose of this is just to make sure that, like, if we're coming down to the wire that you – like recognize we still would be owed the commission so all right sellers warranties and disclosures this one uh, with the seller when I get to this section and what I'm explaining to the seller is the seller disclosures is I'm telling them that in this section you're warranting some things to us basically that you are the owner of the property you have the right to sell the property but you're also going to disclose to any buyers everything you know about the property and and in fact at this section, and we'll get to the seller disclosures in a little bit, but when I get to this section, I tell the sellers, the seller disclosure form is your get out of jail free card. So remember, yes, on Tuesday we talked about the uh, buyer due diligence form is our get out of jail free as an agent. The seller disclosures is the seller's get out of jail free card. And I'll say more about that when we get to it here. But I just explained that to them there. Section five is the agency relationships, which we talked about on uh, Tuesday. But just as a reminder, what are your fiduciary duties? Um, cold AC. Okay, which stands for confidentiality. good. Confidentiality. Confidentiality. Obedience. Obedience. Loyalty. 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 Full disclosure. Care. Reasonable care. care. And the accountability. accountability. Okay, good. Awesome. All right, next page. I page have one two. question yes. before we go on. So on the protection period, so some of the listings that I have right now are expired. Okay. So, and I did have one seller ask me that. Ask if, you what? If, if, if a seller or if a buyer comes through that was actually, had already looked at the property when it was under contract under the other agent, mm -hmm. is there going to be a commission out there? So, yes. what do I, I say yes. But then I, for how much time do I need to look at the contract? Yeah, look and see time? what you put in there. Because if depending on what you had put in on the contract is for how long. Are okay. you talking about the previous I'm agent. talking about the previous oh, agent. Gotcha. The, okay, okay, sorry, I oh. misunderstood. So yeah, I understand what you're saying. So more than likely, so you'll notice on ours, let me let me read through ours real quick. 
Ours just says, if within blank months after the termination or expiration of listing agreement, the property is acquired by any party to whom the property was offered or shown by the company, the seller's agent, the seller, or another real estate agent during the listing period or any extension of the listing period, the seller agrees to pay the company the brokerage fee stated in Section 2. Ours cuts off there. On most other agreements, so yeah, I would say to get the seller to look at it. Okay. But I still think you're going to be okay. But on any other one that I've ever seen outside of our companies, it says comma. So in, on ours, it says stated in Section 2. Ours has period. It has comma unless listed by another brokerage. So my guess is it probably says unless listed by another brokerage, in which case you're totally fine. You don't have to worry about it. So even if it if it's just a period, it doesn't have that little caveat at the end. So say the previous listing had a three month protection period, you take it, and then it's only been two months, and you have a, a you know exclusive right to sell that. If it was a previous, would they still have a claim on it? So I, I'm just I let me caveat. I am not an attorney. I did stay at a Holiday Inn last night. <laughs> so, but um, personally, I think like on ours, let's say that 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 what I was thinking that her she took the listing and then now it expired, and they relisted with somebody else, and somebody who looked at it the day before it expired buys it. I think uh, if this went to court, I don't think ours would stand up. I I think the way ours. So to me, it's more of again of playing poker with somebody. And hey, this is if you sell it within that time, we're still going to be able to commission. I think if you really took it to court, a judge would look at it and go, that's not fair. Like, you had your chance. You didn't get it done. They went and found somebody else. You're not getting it. Like, I honestly, now, if we had an attorney in there, they might totally disagree with me. But I personally think there's no way a judge is going to go, yep, sorry, Joe, you owe two commissions now. But, but so it, it puts it in the seller's mind. That's right. Of, hey, well, I mean, and that, to me, is kind of where I would say is, is the way ours is worded. Every I've never seen one outside of ours. They all have comma unless listed with another broker. So if we take an expired listing for say like kidney killing, then we're we're good. Then as a general rule, just based off what you're saying, then we don't have to worry about it. I said the protection period. Yep, I wouldn't worry about it at all. Where but where it will come into play though, is that like I told you, we had the one. That the agent had shown the property to some people, the listing expired, and then like three or four days later, those people went back and, hey, you're not listed anymore. We want to buy the house. And, and the agent came to me saying, hey, is there anything we can do? I pulled up this and looked at the production period. They had put zero. And I'm like, why did you put so zero? So they got directly to the sellers. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm like, why did you put zero? Well, because I just feel like we're not going to do anything about it anyway. Well, then there's your answer, you know. <laughs> So, anyway. so, so if there's not another seller agent involved, then you can go after them. Then yeah, we would, and we would go say, hey, no, we're owed a commission because these people found the property because of our. But, but how many agents actually track that? Like, well, oh, that's just that was my buyer that bought the house. Yeah, I, I would not put the effort into tracking yeah. it. However, occasionally did. it's like if it was your neighbor's house, you had listed like. Or, you see or, the people, you might yeah. like, hey. or like if you're working with the, the loan officer, they call and say, hey, you know, yep. we just did a loan for the house for your buyer. Yep. Could be. All right, next page. Now, so we'll, we'll pick up the pace a bit now on this because a lot of this stuff's going to be the same. Uh, there's a few sections that aren't. But so um, expiration. Now, uh, this one I do want to read to you because I want to make sure that you guys understand this. This, and, and again, this is different than the, if you went under the MLS and printed off the listing agreement, it does not have this section, section six. It says the expiration date of this contract will automatically extend to the closing date if the property is under contract. When the property is pending slash under contract, seller instructs seller's agent to not present any more offers. So remember, we have an obligation to present offers if they're written, but this now is overriding that and saying, the sellers told us, once you get an offer, not to. Now, let me explain why we put that in here. In 2010, there were tons and tons of short sales. And on a short sale, once you got an offer and got it submitted to the bank, like it was taking a minimum of six weeks to get that approved through the bank. The longest one I ever saw was two years. It took two years from when the offer was came in was submitted to the bank and the bank finally approved it and sold it on a short sale. Two years it took. So here's the challenge. The reason this got put in there is because once you had an offer and it was submitted to the bank as a short sale, 
if you all of a sudden got another offer that was maybe a little bit higher and you wanted to go do it, you reset the clock. So imagine that two-year one, if a year and a half into it, all of a sudden now, oh, we got a different offer, we're going to submit this other offer, like you're now another two years or whatever it would have been. But minimum, of it was six weeks. The fastest I ever saw one get done during that time was six weeks. So the idea of this, we don't want to present other offers, is we just don't want to have to deal with it because we got it sent to the bank. So on this, just know, like, you still can go and present another offer. So if it makes sense, but we don't have to. Even though we've got the state law that says you have to present it, this is now overriding that because we're agreeing with the seller. that If I get another offer in, we don't have to present it. No. But that would only be a backup offer, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. And it isn't that though in a lot of, I mean, because I've bought quite a few homes as the person in backup. Isn't that a, a better situation for your client to have a backup offer? To be, yes. As a backup, yeah. But like I say, on this, this was more around the short sale kind of a thing and, and, a, be, and a little bit better offer coming in or something. And now, hey, well, now we got to restart the whole process. So, but yeah, for sure. If, if I can get a backup offer, I 100% want to have that. So that's why, I'm, that's why I'm pointing this out to you is we don't have to, but more in our current environment, we probably want to, for sure. All right, section seven is similar to what we had talked about on the due diligence where it says you are trained, and this is how I explained to the seller again. This section says I'm trained in the marketing of real estate, that I'm not an attorney, I'm not a CPA, I'm not a property inspector, I'm not a surveyor, like any of those type of things, like you need to call an expert in that area, don't rely on me, okay? Section eight is dispute resolution. What this is just we're saying that in the event there's a dispute between the seller and us that we will go to mediation first. In the event that that doesn't fix it and we end up in court, section 9 says that the prevailing party is entitled to reasonable attorney's fees. And then section 10 is where the seller is giving us permission to advertise their property. So they're giving us permission to put a sign out, giving us permission to put it on the MLS, to advertise pictures, all that kind of stuff. So down in section 10, you'll see, uh, and I want to talk about a couple of these. 10A, it says that we can disclose to the MLS after closing the final terms and sales price of the property. Why do we need that? Because we're, we're a non-disclosure yeah. state, so we got to get permission. The other thing that it says is 10B there, which I don't know why it doesn't go on the new line. But 10B says disclose to the MLS the square footage of the property as obtained from, and then there's a box there. So where that came from is the division of real estate has said that a seller has to disclose two places. There's two places that the seller has to disclose where they got the square footage from. Now this is a little ironic, and I'll tell you why in a second, but there's two places. So where would be the two places that the seller has to disclose where the square footage came from, and it's not the MLS? That's usually the answer that I get, so I'll just preempt you. It's not the MLS. Well, the, no, where they got it from. No, sorry, I'm not asking the question right. There's two places that the seller have to say, the seller has to disclose if they got it from the appraiser or if they got it from there, but they have to disclose that somewhere where they got it from. One of them is property condition disclosures. So one of them is seller property condition disclosures. It has where you got the square footage from. The other one is right in front of you. This listing agreement. So here's why, when I said it's ironic, here's why it's ironic. In our listing agreement, the seller has to tell us where they got the square footage from. Where, did, where do they usually get the square footage from? Uh, yeah. From us. So we're usually getting it from the county records, giving it to them, and now they have to tell us where they got it from. A little ironic, but that's what it is. So, so you're just going to check the, whichever box applies there. County records, an appraisal, building plans, or have some other way. Should you ever go measure it? No. no. Good answer. All right. The other things that this is saying is we can get financial information. We can have a key to the property. We can put a key box on the property. We can hold open houses on the property. We can order that preliminary title report. We can order a home warranty. And we can talk to the seller about real estate services and goods, which overcomes the do not call list. We can place the earnest money in an interest bearing trust account, which we're not doing. So that we're not putting it in an interest bearing trust account, but we could. Um, and then 10L is when the property is pending or under contract, seller instructs agent to not present any more offers or allow any more showings, which again, you still can, but just know 
this gives us the chance to so just to go back one just because that's a question that came up in role play today is so the company is currently not putting in an interest bearing account are is there any plans to start that great question so about a year ago we were we actually we were looking at doing it but what we found is that in order to do it there was so much hoops you had to jump through that we finally just said yeah, it's just not worth it but, so no so at this point, there's not a plan to do that. So we have, we can, but we don't. We're not. Okay. Question. Yes. So this home warranty plan is that something we should always? Are we supposed to recommend that to her? If we have a listing agreement, to recommend that they do a home warranty plan on, like, what? For me, I here's what I think. Great question. Here's what I usually tell the seller when we get to this section. What I say is, I would recommend that you do a home warranty, and the the reason is. Almost every buyer that comes in is going to ask you to pay for one anyway. And so what will happen is so our current, the partner we're, that we are partnered with, so to speak, is American Home Shield. American Home, and I'm sure others have this too, but American Home Shield, you can put the home warranty, if, if the seller is going to buy it for the buyer, which almost every offer is going to come in and they're going to ask the seller to pay for it anyway. But if there's, so if the seller is willing to do that, they can also, for an additional $75, which honestly, I highly recommend doing this, the seller, it'll cost them an extra 75 bucks, but during the time of the listing, they get the exact same coverage that a buyer would get for the one year afterwards. And, and here's why, I, it is amazing how many times during an inspection, something will show up. Or right before closing, the, the water heater goes out. The furnace quits working, the AC quits working, what, something. So for me, I usually recommend to the seller, you're going to probably end up paying for it for a buyer anyway. But so for an extra 75 bucks, you could have the same coverage. And I like to call it inspection protection to the seller. You can get inspection protection so that if, if there is something in the inspection that comes up that would be covered by the home warranty, you can just submit it and wow. pay the, I mean, it's just, wow. there's a $75 service fee, but you pay the $75 service fee and then whatever, Problem was they don't come and fix it. Yeah, I had I was selling a house and I bought the warranty in my well pump went out. Yeah, so that was a two thousand dollar hit. Yeah. Wow. So one of the other things too is that you can, as an agent, through American Home Shield, buy a home warranty for your house. Usually, the way you get there, there's two options to getting home warranties. One is when you purchase the house and they usually give it to you the first year at a reduced rate. The idea being that you'll and in fact the home warranty company hopes you use it during the one year. They hope there's a claim because what they've found is if there's a claim during the first year, the people will renew the plan and keep it going. If there's not, they usually go, eh, let's not. So the home warranty company hopes there's a, a claim on it. So, but you as an agent can go purchase the home warranty on your own house at that reduced price and get the same, like it's better coverage when you first buy it than if, you, if just you called up American Home Shield today and added it. It's about, I don't know, 50 or 75 bucks more and you get less coverage. But and if you do it as an agent, what if you do it too without a house listed? There's a like a thirty day grace period. Yeah, thank you. That's yeah. That's the other thing is when you call to order it, they'll say, okay, it's not in effect for thirty days. Versus as an agent doing it and getting the purchase plan, you it's effective immediately. Which I actually did just two years ago. I thought my air conditioner was going out, so I put on the home warranty. It, we had issues. We had to call and they came out and fixed stuff. Didn't replace it. Last year, at the end of the year, like right as the last week that it was hot, it starts making this weird noise. I'm like, hey, I'll be adding the home warranty before spring. So I added the home warranty and I added it a month ago and then what, two weeks ago or whatever when it was warmer, like all of a sudden it was quick cooling. So the guy's coming out today to do it. Wow. So anyway, to me, I'm a believer. What's, what is the initial cost for the warranty? Uh, I want to say I paid four fifty. Yeah, four fifty. Is it is it just one flat fee, or does it depend on the cost of the house? So you can either agent. pay it. You I can pay it monthly, month. or American Home Shield too also has like if you get this program, it's four hundred. This one's five hundred. Oh. Um, IX yeah. is five hundred. So it depends on how much coverage you want. Yeah. Okay. Or and oh, is okay. that something that you? So you're just telling your client. You're when you fill it up, you tell that you suggest that they. Do that they follow, or do you as an agent say I can help you set this up? Yeah, you know, we we would just have we yeah you can get it set up for okay. you. So, yeah. but but you can get that seller protection, and like I say, I just always tell them it's inspection protection.
because it's amazing how much stuff goes wrong during the lap, like right before closing. But is so. there like um, and if you want them to pay for it, do you want to do like an addendum or something? Or if you want who to pay for it, the seller. Oh no, the seller's gonna pay. For it. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. And, and the way it works actually. Where you yeah. have, uh, about a, uh, who's gonna pay? For oh, okay. It. And yeah. how much they will, you want the seller to contribute? Well, and that's the other thing that's cool is if they get the seller protection during the listing coverage, it's an extra seventy-five bucks, like I said, but they don't pay it until closing. Yeah, and so, and that's great. yeah, and the cool thing is, so let's say they do it, they put on the seller coverage, they have a claim, but then the house never sells. They'll never pay the four hundred and fifty or five hundred bucks for that wow. uh, home warranty, and even though they use the coverage. So, hmm. I've actually wow. agents that will list a house for a week just to be able just to put it on. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yes. Yeah. Now they will though. If if when they come out, they can see it was a pre-existing, like like you said, and they're like, yeah, this clearly hasn't worked for two years. Like they're going to say, no, we're not covering it. But. All right. Uh, let's see. And then M10M is just says, in the event that the buyer's agent requests to present an offer in person to the seller, seller gives written authorization to the designated listing agent of the brokerage to decide if the offer will be presented or in person or not. When I first started in the business 23 years ago, pretty much every offer we did, you would go present it. You would call up the listing agent and say, I've got an offer. Can I come present it to your seller? You'd schedule a time. You'd drive over to the seller's house. Usually I would have the buyer sitting in the car. They would stay in the car, I would go in the house, I would sit down with the seller and go through the offer and explain it to their agent and the seller, and then I would say, you know, we'll just be sitting out in the car, let us know. And then I'd go out and tell my seller, oh, I could tell like they were excited about it or whatever. And then they would discuss it and either do a counter offer, accept or reject or whatever, and then they would usually bring it out to the car and go, all right, we've countered you and this is what we countered. And then I, so I'd get out of the car, the agent would explain it to me, I'd get back in the car, all right, here's what they did. Wait, like we would put the deals together like right on the spot versus today, oh, yeah. like it just yeah, fax it over or yeah. not fax, not even really fax it over, <laughs> email it over mm -hmm. and they never even call you. Like, so I still think, especially in our market, if you could go present an offer, it could be a good thing. Now on the other side of that, I don't really want somebody to come do that to my list. Uh -huh. It's a question or no? Okay. All right. But this is saying, just as clarification that you know, so if they want to come do it, they're getting the sellers giving them written authorization to make that decision, so that the agent can just say no. No, I don't want. Yeah, it gives me the offer. If I'm the listing agent, to just say no, I don't want to. Or maybe I say, hey, but this seller, that's going to be a good idea. Let's do it. All right, section eleven is personal property. Here's what I explain to a seller when I get to this section. I tell the seller what this is saying is that we're not responsible. Of your personal property like so on a showing if somebody comes through and steals something like this is saying we're not responsible so really how I tell the seller is if you have anything that you're worried about drugs guns jewelry drug I already said drugs any of that stuff that's a big one to do. I know exactly <laughs> if you have, if you're worried about that get it out of the property now now along with that on this personal property too let's say that I'm sitting here at the seller's house and they said Oh, we're not going to include this projector. What I say then is let's get it out right now. Like you will be amazed. I've seen so many times, let's say there's like a shelf on the wall here. I've seen times where the seller says, I don't want to include that shelf. So I put it in the MLS. Shelf not included. Buyers come through. Write the offer. We want you, here's the we'll give you a full price, but we want the shelf. And you go, no, the seller goes, No, I already said we're not giving the shelf. And you go back, they won't give the shelf. Well, then we won't buy the house. Like, seriously, that happens. We won't buy the house. If you're not going to give us the shelf, we won't buy your house. So to avoid that, I just tell the seller, if you want the shelf, get it down now. Go replace it with a different one, patch the hole, something. Like, I've had that with ceiling fans. I had, like, it, weird. Like, somebody was like, we are not in, put, leaving the ceiling fan. We're taking it. I'm like, all right, well, then you got to get it out now because they're going to go, I want the ceiling fan. Like, seriously, that happens. So, okay. So that's what I do on personal property. Attachment, there either are or are not. And again, that would be if you're doing an addendum, almost always you're going to check the are not box on it. Next page. I'm trying to hurry because I can see in your faces you're had enough. All right, electronic transmissions and counterparts, section 14. 
What this is saying is that we're agreeing that we can do it electronically, so we can email, we can do digital signatures, we can do all of that, and we can do it as counterparts, and it's okay as well. Section 15 is the due on sale, which just, I'm going to like pick up the pace. If you have questions, okay to stop me though. Okay. It's due on sale, section 15. When does that come in play? It's only two scenarios. Owner financing. Seller finance. And something to do with the lease. Lease option. Lease option. Yep. If it's if they're not doing a seller finance or lease option, this section, and that's what I would tell the sellers. You only really need to know about this if we're doing a lease option or seller financing. Did you want your cash out or do you want to finance it for the buyer? No, we want our cash out. Okay, then this doesn't matter. All right, 16 is the Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act, or you'll hear it referred to as FERPTA. On this, what it is, so let me explain this. What happened is so much money had come into the U.S. prior to 2008 that the foreign investors, and then with the downturn in the economy, a lot of them just kind of walked away. Or, and or they sold properties at the peak of the market and then never paid taxes. So you kind of had both sides of the spectrum there. So what the IRS did, which this makes zero sense, but this is how, I mean, it kind of makes sense, but not really. What the IRS did is said, okay, we are going to enact a law that says if the person who is selling the home is a foreign investor and they don't have a tax ID number, and basically, if there's a gain on the property and they don't pay their taxes on it, the buyer, the person who bought the house, gets to pay their taxes. Which, like, kind of, like, how is that fair? Like, I went and bought the house. I shouldn't have to pay the taxes for the seller who sold it. But that's the way the law is written. So is there a way for it to them, a buyer to know up front? So the key, yeah, here, which that's what this section is about. Here's the key, is... What this, what has to happen is the buyer has, either the buy, the seller has to give to the buyer their tax ID number, which, like, so imagine, Karina, I want to buy your house, give me your social security number. How excited about, are you to do that? No. So the, the other option is they, so the seller has to either give the buyer their tax ID number or their social security, well, if it's a foreign investor, it'd be a tax ID number. So they got to give them their tax ID number or they have to give it to the title company. So that's the recommendation. As long as the title company gets a tax ID number from the seller, the buyer's off the hook. But the buyer is responsible to make sure that the seller does it. So from the standpoint of the listing agreement, for us as a brokerage, we're asking here, you'll see the boxes, that the seller is or is not a foreign person. So essentially what we've got to figure out is if they are a foreign investor, do they have a tax ID number? And if they don't, then they need to apply to get one. Otherwise, the buyer could be responsible for their taxes. So now, for, would the title company be aware that that person didn't have a tax ID? Would that come up in, a, yeah. in the process? Yeah, of so, since, so we locally we had an issue with it. A title company up in Park City had somebody that had bought a property, sold it, made a ton of money, didn't pay the taxes on it, and the IRS actually came back to the title company saying, you owe us the money. You owe us the, and it was like 25, 30 grand, something like that. And I think they ended up having to pay it. But so since then, I think every title company now automatically gets from the seller that. So like, it's not something you really probably need to worry about because title companies just kind of do it now. But on the seller side, it's good for you to know on the seller side up front, are you a foreign person or not, defined, as defined by the IRS. I have a question. I've bought a lot of houses, but I don't remember ever dealing with a title company until... Well, look, as the settlement. yeah, as the buyer, you would have already given that to the your lender, so oh, the they lender. probably okay. yeah. So okay. they and on the buy side, it's not a big deal. It's on the sell side that they usually want to verify that. Well, so yeah. usually, what the title company does now is they just have a separate form that you have to fill out. Okay. And if you said yes, then they're going to gather it. If you said no, I'm not, they wouldn't have gathered. And and you get that form from your agent or no? Nope, the title company, company would do it at close. Yeah, see, I've sold houses too. Though. Well, I'm sure but they asked you, the what happened is they had a list that they had you asked you four or five questions, and you just yeah. probably didn't. That one of them was, are you a foreign investor? And you said no, and then you just didn't think about no, it. Probably, probably. So for the most part, this section here is going to be kind of not, I mean, it, it's not, so as you're talking to your client, you're just, to explain it, you just start asking them, are you a, is, are you a foreign investor? Yeah. yeah, that's all. Yep, and that's if they say no, nope, then your check is yeah. not. Yeah. But we do want to get the forwarding address, or if they are, excuse me, if they are a foreign investor, we want to write their address on that line. If they're not, we don't need to. 
Because like I just did a cell and the seller was in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. You know, so that would, this was a relevant issue. Right, right. So yeah, and, and, and a lot of it's going to boil down to how much did they make off the sale of the property and stuff too. All right, 17, authorization to furnish the TILA RESPA, which we talked about that on Tuesday. That gives you permission to look at the closing disclosure. Uh, without it, you wouldn't technically be able to. 18, it says this is an entire agreement. There's not anything that's not disclosed in writing. Everybody's going to sign, the sellers, you sign, and then again, point out the red. That do they have a property to sell or purchase outside of the market? So if this is a seller, where are you moving to? And you need help in finding a home there. So you can get her in. All right, next is the MLS data input sheet. So the next six pages is the MLS data input sheet. On this, basically what you're, what you're filling out on this form is what's going to show up on the MLS. And, and a lot of times, especially the first time you fill out one of these, you're like, well, I don't know a lot of this stuff, or I'm not sure what I need to do. So notice where it has list price, and then off to the left, there's a dot. And right below it says short sale, and there's a dot. But then if you go over to the right, you see least considered, and there's no dots on there. If there's a dot next to the like list price and short sale, you have to fill out that section. You, it's required. If there's not one, like least considered yes or no, you could not check either of the boxes and you're totally fine. But the MLS is going to require you to put in anything that's got a dot. So like the address of the property, you have to put it. The city, the, height, the school district and schools, you have to put. The tax parcel number, you have to do. Like property type, though, you could not check one of those if you didn't want to. Style, you could not check one if you didn't want to. I would recommend that you will, but your build, you have to put. So does that make sense? So, what, yeah, go ahead. What about a building lot? What about? What else do you have to fill out? Oh, great question. On a building lot, there's a separate form. Okay. There's a residential uh, listing for land, or excuse me, not residential, <laughs> the listing you put form for land. Okay. And you would do that. Yeah. Is it more beneficial for your your for the marketing of it to add, like you said, it's not necessary to put it, but you could. Like, is it gonna if you if you mark single family and they'll oh, yes. required, but it's gonna be more yes. beneficial, right? I would yeah, I would yeah, thank you. I would still recommend here's what I say to do. When you're filling this out, go through it and if you know, check the box or fill it in. If you don't know, look and see if there's a dot. If there is, go figure it out. If there's not, then don't worry about it. So yeah, that's what F. I would say definitely, for sure, like I said, on the style, if you didn't put, I mean, thankfully we have photos and stuff, but if you didn't check any of the boxes, like people do searches based on the style, you wouldn't show up. So yeah. All right, next page. On the next page, same kind of a thing. You're just going through filling it out. Um, on the, the middle section there that has levels 1, 2, 3, 4, and basement and all that, I just want to run through a few things on here just to make sure you guys understand it. So obviously square footage makes sense, which level the master bed, bed uh, master bedroom's on. Then under the bass you've got F, 3, fourths, and half. The F is what? Four. Three fourths, obviously is three fourths. Which what would what would be the definition of a three fourths bath? Shower. Just the shower yeah, just the shower. And then a half bath would be just the toilet. Okay. And then you've got family, which level the family room's on, the den, formal lining, in the kitchen dining. What does K stand for? Kitchen? Yep. So what it's asking for is where is the dining? And K is the dining would be in the kitchen. B would be like there's a snack bar or an island bar. F would be formal dining, and S is semi formal. So what's the difference between formal and semi formal? Three walls. Yes, basically, yeah, the way it's got a formal is going to have basically three walls that separate it off from everything else. All right, let's see. And what was S, sorry? S is semi formal. Now, in, in Utah, is an unfinished area considered in the square foot? Because in Oregon, oh, great question. Can yes. Unfinished area. Yeah, yeah, in Utah, even if the basement wasn't finished, you still list it. So we look more at just the total square footage. Yeah, some, now, some not including even, the garage. Though. Yeah, some states didn't count the garage. Yeah, we do not count. That would not count the garage. Um, so in the case of it, the county records are off on the square footage, how would you, do you have to get like, an appraisal to fix that? Or? No, but how do you know they're off? Um, well, I like talked to a few different people 
like about their square footage and like one person that I was talking to I was like okay now your house sends this many square feet right and they're like no and I'm like well that's what it says on the county records they're like yeah the county records are actually wrong um, and like this is how we know they're wrong like when we bought okay. the house they explained the stuff like we have record of it okay but so then I would say go back to their appraisal from when they bought the house if they have it first in the event they don't let's say they don't have it then at that point there are appraisers that you can pay to go out, not to do an appraisal, but just to measure. And because we don't want to be responsible for the measure, but you can pay, and usually it's 50, 75 bucks, something like that. They'll come out and measure the house for you. So that's what I recommend. Can they submit it to county records? Has not change it on a county level? They, they could, level? but most people don't want to because it'll increase their taxes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yes, they could. So what if he, the seller bought the house and they, there was an addition onto it that was not on the county records and now they're trying to sell the house? That means it wasn't permitted. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But now they're trying to sell the house. Can they count that? Uh -huh. So they just have the appraiser from when they bought it who measured it. They could say, hey, you know, here's the appraisal. These are the actual measurements. Mm -hmm. And then they we could list it at uh -huh. that. I'd okay. put it at the whatever that square footage is. Okay. But then on the seller disclosures, it's going to say, did you get the permits? And they should probably say no. Okay. All right. Let me see if there's anything else. If you notice anything else you have questions on, let me know. Let me know. I'm just kind of pointing out the stuff that typically comes up. And there's nothing else on that page unless you guys have something. So next page. The questions that usually come up is down, it's about three fourths of the way down under the listing information section, there's the listing type. It's got EAL or ERS. What's the difference? What's EAL? Which means what? That they're doing an open listing. Yeah, which essentially means uh, close. It means that if I put it as an EAL, I'm the only one that can bring the buyer. The exclusive agency listing is, it's listed, but I'm the only one that's going to get paid to bring a, by bringing a buyer to the house. So we we don't ever really want to do that. We want to do the ERS, the exclusive right to sell. I'm okay. sorry, I don't see where you're at. This is in the listing information? Yep. Right. Oh, EAL right there. Yep. Okay. We don't want to do EALY? Because no you one else have to bring to a buyer. list it and bring the buyer. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. You're not opening it up to anybody else to bring a buyer to the home. Okay. Do you want ERS? Yes. Which means there's really no point. Yeah, if you're doing the EAL, like, why is it the MLS? Yeah. Like, why are you putting it on the MLS then? It's, all right, uh, photo instructions. I will provide in ten days. Is is kind of just the default now that they. It used to be years ago. The MLS would go out and take a picture of the outside of the house. We, the agents never did, but now it, you have to. Uh, let's see the dual or variable rate. Yes or no? What would be a dual or a variable rate? Any ideas? All right, I'll help you with this. Where are you? Where are oh, just so two lines down from the, or three from the listing type, oh. the EAL or ERS. There says dual slash EAR rate. Oh. Variable rate. Yes or no? Or dual. Is it? Is that their loan? Right there. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So what that's talking about is on the commission. So we oh. spent a long time talking about how much is being offered on there. Mm -hmm. What something... I'm always hesitant to share this with you because sometimes then people go, oh, that's a good idea. Don't do this. But agents do this. Is they'll go in and say to the seller, well, you could do it. I'd be okay if you did this. If you go in and said, okay, I know our listing agreement says 7%, but if I end up representing both the buyer and the seller, I'll do it for 6 If you did that, then down on dual or variable rate, you need to check yes. And the idea behind that is that way it's disclosing to other agents out there that if Jill brings me an offer, and I, so let's say my seller's got multiple offers. I'm representing one of the buyers, so I'm going to be a limited agent. Jill's writing an offer on the other one, and we both bring a full price offer. Whose offer is the seller accepting? Yours. Mine, because I, yeah. they get 1% less commission by doing it. So this dual or variable rate is just if you've offered something like that, you need to say, yes, there's a dual or a variable rate commission on the commission. So as a, as a buyer's agent, would you approach the seller's agent and talk about that? or? I would, yeah, I would. I'd call you and say, hey, so on, I noticed on the MLS it says dual or variable rate. Tell me about what that is and see what they say. I mean, like if you called me, I would just say, oh, I told the seller that if I represented them, I would charge them 1% less in commission. So, so would, it doesn't change anything, right. but, but it, you, it allows you to tell your seller or your buyer, buyer. Yeah. 
Now, I probably wouldn't tell you how much. I just would say I, I told them I would reduce the commission. But then you could tell your buyer, even if we offer exactly the same offer, they could they're probably going to choose theirs. Okay. All right. So you recommend I would just put yes and I would just... No. 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 I would say do, do no. Do no? Yeah. Okay. Don't, don't offer to give less commission. All right. Next one is the compensation offered, the BAC based on gross or net. You guys understand gross? Do you know, I need to explain it or no? I understand. Now, is that negotiable though? Because like when mm -hmm. with working with my agents, I always pay a net, never gross. Mm -hmm. So when you say negotiable, yeah, with, with, okay. with, right at the time of me listing your property, absolutely. Well, no, like like we had an offer come in, and, and oh. the the buyers wanted us to pay some closing costs. And so, so you said we won't pay the commission. Yeah, they'll pay the commission. Yeah, because so, sometimes they're ten, fifteen thousand dollars. So I would say yes. So it's the answer is yes. So if I'm listing the property, we're going to negotiate it when we fill this out. If I'm the buyer, then we'd have to negotiate it. Technically, we should be negotiating through that commission agreement we talked about. Okay. So when you check gross or net, is that what you're paying out on gross or net, or what you're receiving on gross or net? Uh, what's what the seller is going to pay out the commission on, and so what the agents would be receiving. Okay, so, so it goes both ways yeah. for both agents. Okay. Because technically, if you're paying closing costs, you're literally, your offer is that much less. It's less. less. Right, okay. but I've heard that always check gross. That, for me personally, I always train it that way. Of just And I, and I don't want to get into it necessarily today, but I feel like when we do net, we're setting ourselves up for some potential issues down the road. And, and I might be totally wrong. But that's just my own personal opinion. So, okay. but I'm fine either way. I well, just and gross for is, me, I just always do gross. Gross is giving you your full commission, getting your full commission. Yeah. Well, and paying the full commission. You're paying the full whoever. commission. Yeah. yeah. So I totally get it. What Long is saying is exactly mm -hmm. right. From a seller standpoint, I would totally argue of yeah, it should be net because essentially these people offered me five thousand less than what this is. So I totally get it. But did the sellers it. even know that's an option? The grocery. <clears throat> well, they should because when you're filling out this form, you got to check one of the boxes. I know, but you fill this out with the seller. Most don't. Most will have it filled out first. So they don't even know. Stuff. Well, but, uh, you still should explain it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you just tell them you're going to click gross. You just tell them that the, the commission is going to be based on the sale of the property, including closing class costs. I just say it's going to be whatever the purchase price is. Purchase commission price. will okay. be. And if they said, well, what is net? That would be if they come in and ask for closing costs, then we'll do it. For, and if they say, well, then that's what I want, then I would do it. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to. It's not, to me, like not that big of a deal. But like I said, I'm, I feel like it could turn into industry-wide a big deal at some point. But... And I might be wrong, maybe it never will. All right, next page. How you, actually, the next two pages are just check boxes. And what I do with the seller is just I will go through and have checked these, and usually while I'm walking through the home, and then I just say to the seller, take a look at this and see what I missed. Now, notice the language that I just used there. Not if I missed something, to see what I missed. Because I, ever, I don't think I've ever filled it out and not missed something. Like, meaning the seller will usually look at it and be like, um, our home is home energy rating or whatever. I mean, they'll find something that they say, it's got outdoor lighting or something. So I always just say, just check through it, see what I missed, and we'll check the boxes. And then they look through it and they usually go, oh, we have outdoor lighting. Great, check the box. All right, so that's for all the check boxes. Any questions on those? Next section is the remarks section. So the page that has remarks on it. So on this one, the top one is going to be the public remarks. And here's how I do this with the seller. Here's what I've just learned is when we get to this section, I just ask the seller, what things do you want to make sure are highlighted in the public remarks? What do you want me to say? And the reason I do that is here's what I found is there were so many times I would go out like on a listing and a seller would tell me like we were walking through the house and they'd say, oh, this table right here that's built in, we're going to leave this table and I build it it's so nice and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I'm like, yeah, it's a table that they're probably going to come in and tear out. So, but you, you, so I don't say anything about it, but then it hits the MLS. They go online because they want to see it. They look and then they call me up, Russ, you didn't say anything about the, that table. So I've just found to avoid having to deal with the phone call of, you didn't say anything about whatever, I essentially let them write the remarks for me. I don't tell them that, 
but essentially by saying, what are the things you want me to make sure to highlight? Then I write it, highlighting all the stuff they want, and then when they pull it up and look at it, they love it because essentially they wrote it. So does that make sense? All right, agent remarks is just going to be things that are for agents. I'll give you an example of one I saw the other day. In the agent remarks, they, the, this property they knew they were pricing way below market. So it said in the agent remarks, offers will not be reviewed by the seller until such and such date and such and such time per the seller's instructions. Like So the agent remarks section is where you're going to put information that only agents need to know, that not the public. Okay? The directions and non-standard address, really pretty rare that you need that anymore. Used to be before, before we were all carrying around a GPS on our phone, you had to sometimes tell people, when you get to the cow, make sure you turn left or whatever, you know. So you had to do that kind of stuff. Today's world, if check it on your GPS and if your phone will get you there, don't worry about putting anything in here. But like I remember one time I was showing a property to my wife's cousin and we were circling like this neighborhood. And I'm like, I know it's right in the middle, but we could not figure out how to get to the house. And finally we figured out there was this little private lane that if you didn't know it was there, you wouldn't, so like that's what something like this would have been to like turn into the driveway on such and such address. But today we all carry around a GPS, so like you probably don't need to put it in here. Exclusion remarks again, my recommendation is get them if they're excluding something, get it out now. Now, in the event that you can't for whatever reason, I don't know what that would be, but yeah, maybe it's their. Or even like cabinets. But even a refrigerator, I usually will say to them, "Can you go get? If you're going to put one, go get it now." And let's. But maybe they say, "I can't. I don't. I don't. I don't have anywhere to put it." Then I would you put the exclusion. And like like cabinets, like I've seen like living rooms where they have like the entertainment center big cabinet thing, and then you think it's included because it looks like it's built in. That's the stage not. sometimes. Then yeah, I mean, it's already yeah. living like yeah. So yeah, that's what I would put in the exclusion. I just like I said, I found. And you'll know, but just like if they say a shelf, like get it rather than put shelf excluded, it'll still come up in the offer. Just get rid of it. Okay? And HOA remarks on this, I usually say put what is included as part of the HOA. Meaning, is there a pool? Is there? Uh, do they shovel the driveway? Like, because otherwise people will call you. What's included? And if I've just found if you just put it there, then nobody calls me to say, can you tell me what's included in the HOA? Question. Yes. Now, if there's an HOA, you're supposed to get a copy of the CCNRs and the minutes. But de does that disclose if the HOA is in underwater, in trouble, you know? Um, if you got... No, it's not. Some HOAs can just, like that, like my friend's uh -huh. son's, it went up from like 180 to like five something yeah. because something yeah. drastic happened and they had to just sell the lead because yeah. they couldn't afford it. Yeah. Well, that's why it's our obvious. I mean, it's you should be doing it because it's going to be in a minute somewhere. It's going to be in a minute. Yeah, you should, well, but the key thing, here's the thing I always say that if, when I'm representing a buyer, I, you want to look at, because if the Repsy says the most recent minutes, well, what if the most recent minutes they were like, in a hurry that week for whatever reason, and we're like, yeah, we, we're not going to really talk about anything. Like, I usually tell the buyer, you should review, like, the last year's worth of minutes. So it's the buyer's to responsibility to get those. Yep. Okay. Um, oh, I had another question there. Oh. Um, never mind. I forgot it. Okay. All right, next page is the seller disclosures. Oh, I remember. Okay. Um, some communities have their own CCNRs that you don't necessarily have HOA. Yeah, mm -hmm. So, um, do we need to get those acquired? If you're the listing agent, tech the, let me rephrase it. Tech, the way the Repsy's written, the seller needs to give it to the buyer. The so, seller needs to. Yeah. But okay. if, when you're acting as our agent, yes, you should make sure they do. Because sometimes they don't even know they have CCNRs. Right. Yeah. And usually you can get that from the title company. Okay. So, okay. All right, next, seller property condition disclosures. On this, keep in mind, here's what I tell them. When I get to this with the seller, here's what I tell the seller. Of all the forms you're going to fill out, this one is the most important. Because if you end up in court, this one's the one that's going to either hang you or set you free. So when in doubt, disclose. Like, I have only had one of my transactions that ended up in small claims court and the seller disclosures. So the seller had moved to Indiana. 
have, they've been gone about a year. Get a phone call. Hey, the buyers who uh, bought the house took us to small claims court. I'm supposed to appear like next week, and uh, it was going to be a thousand dollars the airfare, and they wanted eleven hundred. They were suing her for eleven hundred dollars. <throat> so she called me and she's like, "What do we do?" And I said, "Well, first thing is let's go look at your seller disclosures because they were saying that the that." The basement had had uh, flooding in it, but the sewer backed up, and that she didn't disclose. So I go grab the seller disclosure, looked at it, she had disclosed it. So I said to her, hey, good news, like, we, you disclosed it, so you're good. You don't have to worry about it. But then I said, but honestly, like, you're going to spend $1,000 to come out here. Why not just offer them the $1,000 or even 800 and not come out? And she was like, no, I'm coming. I'm in, out of principle. I'm not giving them the money. Great. She flies out. I go, this was in West Valley. We go to the West Valley Small Claims Court. The judge says to the buyer, tell us why we're here. Well, they didn't disclose that there had been water in the basement. Some tree roots grew in, grew into the sewer, and now it's backed up. We think they should pay for all that. The judge turned to her and said, well, what do you have to say? And I had told her, take the seller disclosures. So she takes the seller disclosures, hands them to the judge, says, right here, I disclosed that we had had water in the basement. So I did tell them. Judge looks at it, says, this your signature? They say yes. He goes, then why are we here? Like, <laughs> they told you. And they say, well, but what about the tree, ramp, tree, tree root branches growing into the sewer? And he goes, the neighborhood I live in, somebody that happens to every year. Like, welcome to home ownership. <laughs> like, that's kind yeah. of what he did. So anyway, these are the most important. So here's a quick question for you. In the event you're sitting there with the seller, and let's say that the seller gets to section four, and they say, let's see, Parker. All right, so I'm the seller, you're my agent. I say, on section four it says, are you aware of any past or present leaks in the roof? So like, we had like, I don't know, a few drops. Like, I mean, I just one day was walking down the stairs and I noticed, like right here, that like there was a little bit of pain kind of feeling, and I was like, oh, but there's may have been some water, and, and I know almost everybody in the subdivision like had major problems. So I just got up on the roof and threw some tar where where everybody else had their problems, and then we paid them with all that. Do I need to disclose that? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, so here's what I for you guys. If they say to you, should I disclose? I don't care what they say after that. The answer is yes. yes. So if they, so, okay, Joe. So, Joe, one time I was walking along and I kind of stubbed my toe on the carpet right there. Like, do I need to disclose that? Yes. Yes. That's my answer. Here's why. Because they'll say I stubbed my toe on the carpet, but then they move out, the buyer moves in, and they find out that, like, every year this big, huge bulge covered, whatever. Like, here's what I tell the seller. Anything you disclose on here, they could never come back on you for. Now, and... A former company that I was with, we had an attorney that was on staff there, and he was selling his house in Farmington. And he found out that the buyers were not going to do a home inspection. And I don't know why he knew, but somehow he knew before he had given them the seller disclosures. And he told me, I redid my seller disclosures, and I noted every crack in cement, anything on the... Because the thing is, anything you note on here, they could never come back and sue you for it. So... But most buy, most sellers look at it and go, well, I don't want to make it look like my house is junky. Like, this is their get out of jail free. Anything you disclose, so, like, has there ever been a leak in the property? Like, if a sink has ever overflowed, they should say, yes, there was. Because what's going to happen is if they came to try to sue you something else that had to do with a leak in the property like that, or, or water flooding or something, the seller could then t show the judge, no, I told him we had had a problem. The judge is going to turn to the buyer and say, well, why didn't you check it out? Why didn't you look at that? Does that make sense? So on these seller disclosures, the most important thing they're going to fill out, and when in doubt, disclose it. Great. I have one that I always help me remind that. When in doubt, write it out. Yeah. Well, this will never look as bad as a home inspection. Right. Yeah. Thank right. You. And here's what I've found. Like for me as an agent, I tell my buyers to prepare them. Like, when you get this, there's probably going to be stuff that they've noted. And I, as an agent, I'm more concerned. If somebody's lived in the house for 20 years and they, I look at the seller disclosures and they're perfect, I'm more leery of that than somebody who says, yeah, we had a leak. This, like, 
using this, which I'm, I actually had exactly what I'm telling you, where I had a little bit of water that had come in, and it wasn't bad, but, and I did. A bunch of people in the neighborhood that had issues, I got up through some tar where they had problems. I haven't had a problem since. But I will be disclosing, yeah, we had that, because nobody can ever come back on me after that. Um, the story of your attorney who went back and redid this, why did he add more because they didn't do an inspection? Isn't that still just on them? It is, but, but he just said, once I knew they weren't doing an inspection, I wanted to make sure that they couldn't come back saying, well, we didn't know because we didn't do an inspection. But wouldn't that just be on them anyway? It should be, but it was just an extra layer of protection. And he's like, if, I, if something happened and I ended up in court, I have every single thing noted to where the judge would say, well, why did you not do an inspection? If they choose not to do an inspection, they're kind of waiving that anyway. Yeah, I would agree, but he, in his mind, it was just that extra layer of... You, you, a judge not uh, if a judge felt bad was like oh yeah these poor people like but he, I don't know he just well, didn't really. disclosures have become a bigger thing in litigation than they used to be yeah because it used to be sold as is well that's not so much I mean, but it still is as it is, is but, but it's becoming more and but more if, if 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 you knew you had had a water leak and you didn't disclose it and a judge got it like you said that's where a judge would go well what else didn't you tell them or you know so. How, how long can you amend it, like add to it? Let's say you say, oh, I didn't like this or like that. Oh, great question. So let's turn to the last page of this. So go to page 7 of 7 on that. And you'll notice there's another spot in there for the foreign investment thing. But on page 7 of 7, there's a disclosure form update. So really, up until, I, to me, I would say to the seller, up until the property is funded and recorded, if something happens, you should update. Or if you forget, you forgot, oh, yeah. I should have put yep. this in. Yeah, so they would fill it out, and you want them to fill this out, like, right away so that you can get it and see it. But then this update form is once you get an offer in, before you send it to the buyer, give them a chance to, did you, if they thought of something else. So, so, so if you think of more things, just, just get, we'll, right we'll redo but it. That could affect the sale. I mean, it could affect the sale of your house. They go, oh, we didn't know all this. Yeah. That window leaked. Or, yep. And we want more money now for that window yep. to be so fixed. Or, it's before they accept an offer from the buyer. I usually get it before they've done the, yeah. Before they accept the offer. Mm -hmm. okay. And then what, as before I send it over to the buyers, after we've got an accepted offer, I just ask the mm -hmm. seller. Do, is anything changed on this? And they're saying yes or no, and then it's okay. All right, next page is the addendum to the seller property condition disclosure. So if, so where I'm saying they need to fill stuff out, if they ran out of space, they can use this addendum to, to note, hey, page number two, item four, whatever, here's the explanation. And I just tell them, look, as long as you explain what has happened, like, hey, we had this leak, this is what we did, like most buyers are going to be just, okay, but when I'm on the buyer side, you may want to say, hey, those things that are noted on there, just check, have the inspector check them a little bit better just to make sure that it is okay. I've got a question. We just, I used to sell it, and I know that their disclosure wasn't truthful. It was obvious mm -hmm. because things that said this had never happened. And I, I being a builder, I, I know, see. you know, but luckily the buyers on that one were my parents and investors. So I just told them, if this, these are the issues that I know of because, you know, I'm a gotcha. But if that were a client, not my parents, my responsibility is still to them. But I'm also not a licensed builder here. I'm not, you know. Yep. And I would just, so, I, that's how I would present it. Is I would say, look, I'm not licensed, but based on the knowledge that I do have, I would check in, check that a little further. Okay. Well, then you could just, you mentioned that to the inspector. Yep. Say, hey, Check and check on this a little bit more. They said there's not a problem with this or that. All right, so that's the addendum. The next page is the wire fraud alert, which we talked about on Tuesday. So just, again, making sure the clients know any emails that you get with wire instructions or phone calls that you get. Like, don't just do it. we got to verify. And, and not to this extreme, but almost to the extreme of going to the title company in person to ask them if it's changed. Okay. And then the last one is the affiliate business <coughs> disclosure, which again is tied to because the owners of Everest also own in Spiro, we have to disclose that, so we just on every transaction get it signed. And then the last page is the lead-based paint disclosure, which we use when? 
before, before 1970. Prior to 1970. Yeah. So on the seller side, you're going to put in the address. Down in section two, they're either going to initial. I don't know why I have a check there because it should be an initial. They're going to initial that they know of lead-based paint in 2A1 or 2A2. They're going to initial that they have no knowledge. And then 2B1, they'll initial that they have records or reports about it, or 2B2, that they have no records or reports about it. So, and as long as they've paid it since then, then they plan, or as long as they, I mean, and all it needs is one coat of paint, and it's no. good. I mean, these still are, I mean, just for not for this, I mean, obviously they saw the real, but just on the, on the knowledge side, like, if they paint it over it, it's... If they know it's there and they put it over, they still well, have it's still there. Yeah. Seventy-eight, it's there. Just say it's there. Yeah, I was gonna say if it was built prior to seventy-eight, there's lead-based paint problem. Yeah, there's no. Yeah. Very unlikely that there's not. Yes. It's just shipping. It's just still don't put you on the wall. Yeah. But if they don't know for sure, right, so just start, as far as like a health, but as far as fixing but, it, yeah. the government requires it to be sanded, but now they have to isolate a room. They'll sand it and paint it. You're right. That's the only requirement. But it has to be done like in hazmat suits. Hazmat suits now. You know, wow. sucking up the. Just like asbestos. Yeah. yeah. Basically, just. To, we're all going to die. Yeah, so. we're all going to die. <laughs> right. I have Seems question. to be the ticket we punched when we got here. I don't have any proof of that, though. Now, the affiliated, the affiliated business um, arrangement, we don't have to do that if they're using a different lender, right? No, you still do need to do I still have to do it. Okay. Because we're just disclosing to them. And the reason why we do that is because even though they may be using somebody else, halfway through the transaction, it's not uncommon for somebody to then be like, oh, we had a problem with our lender, and let's go with it's yours nice. now. So it's just to, for our, to protect the company is we just do it every time. Okay. Well, you would do this on a buyer just to sell. Both. 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 Okay. Meaning if, it, if I rep whoever I represent. Is every, every listing of a thing that they say? Archer. Correct. Correct. Don't no overthink it, dude. Yes. No, there's affiliated <laughs> business arrangement. Now we sell it like we have to get buyers. Yes. yes. So as far as like, not with like, say I did a buyer broker with something and I do it then, or with as part of the transaction. Just part of the part transaction. Of gotcha. This wasn't in my last one. I've not used this. Yeah, it's a new form. It, okay. it may not be fully everywhere yet, but okay. it is from. I don't know when we started, but it's required now. About a month ago. Okay, everybody signed in, hopefully. And uh, thanks for being here. So Tuesday, Tuesday's class will be the Rev C workshop, which is kind of a fun one. And uh, Jason Carlson's going to do it, and because uh, I'll be out of town. And then Thursday is the, we're going to play Jeopardy. So it's kind of the summation like of the that. class. It's, that one's a fun one, too. So what was that question you were talking about that nobody's answered? I'm going to tell you now because it's we're already past time. We'll be here for another hour. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll give it to you quickly. Okay. Usually what happens is we get to the admin fee and people go, why don't we charge that? And then I usually say, well, because we pay you too much of a commission. You're on too high of a commission. If everybody would lower their commission by 5 to 10%, ah. we, well, is that not That's true? We could get rid of it. Pay more to the broker is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> it's because, but no, truth, like when I first started, every agent was 50-50, and the highest anybody got was an 80-20. No caps. Right? No caps. Well, yeah. And today, like, not uncommon for people to go, well, 50-50, and then you go 21,000 yeah, in cap. 20, like, cap. I had times where the my, on my split, the brokerage made 60 grand. Today, they're going to make 21. 20, like. So as a result, the company's got to make money somehow, so they passed it to now your clients. So if you don't want to charge it to your client, you could if you wanted to go to the to the company and say, I'll reduce my commission split by, I don't know how much, five or ten, they'd probably say, Great, don't ever charge that again. <laughs> but my question is, how do you know when to charge what fee? Because like you say Just minimum two ninety five, charge whatever you want. Yeah, you keep a percentage. I know. I always have to point that out because because yeah. my friend Rick here <laughs> would always explain it as charge the five ninety five. Then you're not paying the the TC yeah. fee, which is not a hundred percent true. You're not paying most of the most of it. Yeah, but depending on your split. Depending on your split, you're yeah. paying half you're of paying it or half. ten yeah. or twenty percent of it. 
Yeah. 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 So yeah. I was, uh, yeah, I always point that out. Like <laughs> we have agents that get seven percent and nine ninety five, so you should be. Able I told to them that that same agent did forty seven hundred dollars worth in addition. Yes. Seven percent. Seven percent plus forty seven hundred. You want Russ to teach you how to do that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He charges a thousand an hour. <laughs> I'll be happy to teach you. <laughs> <laughs> you said you're quiet.